These books all won major literary awards in 2023, but does that make them the best books of the year? Hello, I'm Eric, and I follow a lot of book prizes. That's making it sound like I'm an addict at a meeting. Hello, my name is Eric, and I follow book prizes. But I do. So I thought it would be fun to make an overview of some of the prize-winning books from the past year, and whether I think they're worthy winners, and whether I think they're worth reading. I will be talking about a lot of books and book prizes in this video, but this isn't by any means a completely comprehensive list of every award-winning book from the past year. That would take hours. I am an American, and I live in the UK, so I'll primarily focus on book awards from those regions, but I will touch upon some international literary awards. But if I don't talk about your favorite prize-winning book, don't come for me. When I made this video last year, somebody commented telling me off for not talking about the Giller Prize, when in fact I did talk about the Giller Prize in that very video. They just didn't watch until that point. So I've been following a lot of these book prizes throughout the year and made separate videos videos uh, about their shortlists and their winners, so I'll put links to those in the description below if you want to find out more details about any of these prizes or any of the books discussed, because this is just a brief overview. And I've also been lucky enough to be invited to a lot of these prize ceremonies, so I've been actually able to film the winner being announced, um, which is very exciting, and to just give you a taste of that. <clears throat> And the winner is... Is Alice Wayne for Emmy Morgan. <laughs> Prize for the Book of the Year 2023 is Margot Jefferson, Constructing a Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Sevin. But the winner of the David Cohen Prize for 2023 is John Burnside. Our Wives Under the Sea. Prophet Song by Paul Lynch. Time Shelter. <laughs> Barbara Kisser. Lots of excitement. Authors are top tier celebrities for me, so it is so wonderful to be able to go to these events and meet some of these authors. Now I'm going to get into discussing different book awards, and I might as well start with one of the world's biggest awards, the Nobel Prize for Literature. No, I was not invited to do that ceremony, but the winner for this year was Norwegian, Norwegian author Jan Foss who has written a huge body of work. Of course, the Nobel Prize isn't just awarded for one single work, but for the body of work from an author. And Jan Foss uh, is one of the biggest playwrights and authors in Norway. Um, he's written many novels. I think his plays are the most produced of any Norwegian dramatist um, after Henrik Ibsen. And uh, I, I've i still only read one of his books, or well, the first two parts of um, his big uh, group of books called the Septology books, which um, were originally published in uh, in English in these um, three different books um, grouped together. So I read the other name a number of years ago and did really enjoy it. And I've been wanting to get to the other ones, but I'd say Jan Foss is probably an author you need to be in the right mood to read. Uh, he, his work is quite often melancholic. It's very introspective. Uh, he, at least in, in this book that I've read, um, he, he writes about spirituality and art and uh, the process of memory, but in such a unique and fascinating way that I, I did uh, really get into this book. But like I said, I need to be in a certain mood to read him, and I've just never been in, in quite the right frame of mind to start any of his other books, but I do want to get to them. The biggest UK literary award for fiction is the Booker Prize, and the winner this year was Prophet Song by Paul Lynch. I was at the prize ceremony giving commentary on the live stream before and after the winner was announced. I wasn't quite as articulate as I hoped I would be. It's quite a frenzied experience being there, trying to give an instantaneous reaction and summarizing all my thoughts and feelings about this book, which is 
a very powerful novel depicting an imagined dystopian society in Ireland, which grows increasingly totalitarian and terrifying over the course of the book. And it follows a woman and her family um, who has, she has quite a few children. Her husband goes missing. Um, and we, we follow her as her liberties are increasingly stripped away. And while this story is about like, large scale conflict and a society breaking down and uh, the the question of our our freedom being gradually stripped away while we are so wrapped up in the busyness of life and so it feels like a cautionary tale in that way but it is also a wonderful tender family story the way um it follows her life as she's um, struggling to maintain her job and she has a father who's suffering from memory loss and um, with the, the loss of um, her husband who's just disappeared and how she's trying to still care for all of her different children. And there's a moment in this book that I remember so strongly of when she sees her adolescent son who is starting to get these ideas um, and gradually be, being militarized and she can see him simultaneously as the sweet boy that she's known and raised throughout her life, but also the man that he's becoming. And she sees him as these things simultaneously. And I felt like this was so relatable. Anyone who has known an adolescent and known that adolescent um, from when they were a child, you can see like both of these things um, in that individual at the same time. And I thought it was so powerful how Paul Lynch depicted that. And I did mention that this is, for some readers, a difficult novel to get into. And I do believe that because the way it is structured with these big blocks of text and there's no quotation marks used in um, the, the dialogue. Um, and once you get used to that, um, it does uh, kind of flow. But also, it develops this kind of hypnotic quality and makes you so entrenched in the consciousness of this woman and her experience um, as her life is falling apart. And uh, it's it's horrifying, um, but also there's um, lots of tender moments and beautiful, beautiful writing in this story. There's also the International Booker Prize for a work of fiction which has been translated into English and published in the UK or Ireland. And the winner this year was Time Shelter by Georgie Gus Bodinoff, um, translated by Angela Rodell. And this is a story, I feel like the Booker Prize, especially this year, is going for novels that have like big political messages, but um, are also quite intensely personal stories because um, this follows the story of a man who opens a clinic, um, which is for people who are losing their memories and um, suffering from dementia. And it's meant as a kind of haven where it creates a number of rooms from different time periods where people that are suffering from this can go in these rooms and dwell in the past as if it's physically around them. But this idea can catches on and it spreads throughout Europe and suddenly everybody wants this experience of inhabiting the past and different countries pass referendums to turn back the clocks to a particular year in time. And so this is saying so much about political discourse in the world today. I feel like in so many different countries, there's a lot of rhetoric from politicians that want to go back to a certain time in the country as if this is like an idealized space, which we could inhabit, like if that was even possible. But also, it's not actually true. I mean, it's <laughs> years ago, things weren't as good as they are today for certain other people. And for some other people, things are worse today than they were yesterday. So it's all really relative. But this is something that politicians play a lot on. And I feel like this is what this novel is exploring a lot. But it's also exploring the process of memory and what it means um, to imagine yourself in this like bygone year and um, to, to have that be 
such a part of your present mind or projecting into the future and trying to live for a future which doesn't actually exist. And um, the, the, all of the issues that go into that, I found it incredibly moving. There were some other aspects of this novel which I felt like didn't work quite as well and the entire conceit that countries are literally like turning back the clock um, was slightly clunky at times but overall um, it's a really powerful message in a very thoughtful book um, that made me consider so many of these issues. The winner of the Women's Prize for Fiction this year was Barbara Kinsolver's Demon Copperhead, which you can see in the video how ecstatic I was that this novel won because I loved this story so much about a mixed race boy born into impoverished circumstances and a broken family in a small Appalachian community and following um, his harrowing journey and struggle for survival against the odds um, throughout a number of challenging circumstances, but also how he finds love and friendship. Uh, it's such a wonderful personal and inspiring story um, that is also a reimagining of a famous Dickens novel and does so in um, such an imaginative and, and powerful way to bring it up to the present of uh, Dickens' message about like social concern, uh, but and also using um, the, the structure and kind of playing upon some of the characters. But um, as I talked about with Barbara Kinsolver, found there, there were certain other characters that she inserted into this book that she felt like Dickens wouldn't have known or might not have cared about some of these individuals and didn't represent them in his fiction, but Barbara Kinsolver wanted to. And it's so fascinating and beautiful how she does that. And the joint winners of this year's Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, controversial, were Trust by Hernan Diaz and why if it isn't Demon Copperhead again which I was so happy to see this book get even more award attention but also Trust by Hernan Diaz which is such an impactful book which I read at the very end of last year. It was one of my favorites and it's a story um, about a wealthy and influential couple um, at uh, in the early um, 20th century and following them over a period of time but looking at their story from very different perspectives and these different points of view give such a different idea of where their wealth came from, uh, the, the motives behind what they were doing. And uh, so, yeah, just gives um, such an interesting look at these power structures and the, the influence of money and, and how history is recorded and then like brushed over or revised um, to suit um, different uh, individuals' uh, motives. It's so good. And I was really glad to see both books honored. The winner of this year's National Book Award for Fiction in America was Blackouts by Justin Torres. And I have just started reading this book finally. And oh my gosh, I am completely entranced by it. Uh, it's the story of a young gay man who goes to stay with an older gay man and together they, they work on this joint project and share their memories and experiences and the dialogue between them. And it's, it's so tender and moving, but also uh, it's very inventive in its structure because it reproduces a number of documents and blacks out a number of sections of the text to make an entirely new text, but also make you contemplate why have certain statements um, been uh, redacted and why um, aren't we allowed to see them? And what does this say um, about what we're racing about history or what we don't want to acknowledge? about the present. Uh, it's so powerful and, and moving, and I have only just started it, but I'm really into this book. The winner of this year's Waterstones debut fiction prize was In Memoriam by Alice Wynn, and this novel grabbed hold of my heart. It broke it, and it reformed it because it is such a beautiful love story about two young men in England uh, who fall for each other but who become soldiers in World War One, and it's about 
the trauma and the terror of that experience, what it does to their relationship, um, how it affects each of their lives. And it is such a gripping journey following their separate stories, but also the lives of a number of different characters of their friends that also become involved in the war, but also the family that they leave behind back in England. And the way this novel is structured with, with letters and news articles and lists of the dead. Uh, it's so impactful and it's just an incredible book and I'm so glad that it got some book prize attention. The winner of the Orwell Prize for Political Fiction was another great gay novel, The New Life by Tom Crew, which is the very first book that I read this year. Such a great story um, set at the end of the 19th century in England following two men who are collaborating on a book um, which is representing the lives of gay men in a very honest way to try to change social attitudes um, towards sexuality and try to change the, the politics and laws around it um, because a lot of gay men were being persecuted and um, so it's representing those lives but it also gets into the, the lives and different struggles of these two individuals and how their expression of um, their true desires um, affects the people around them and so I feel like it is a very political novel in that way about the, the difficulty of trying to enact social change and political change on a personal level and trying to represent the, the change you want to see in your personal life, but about the real consequences and difficulty of that and the, the struggle of that such a great story. The winner of the Polari Book Prize, which celebrates queer literature, uh, is the great lesbian novel Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. And I just read this um, very recently. Um, it came out last year and so many people have loved it. I've been meaning to get to it and I finally read it. And it is absolutely wonderful. It's chilling and strange and uh, quite like scary and unsettling in a lot of ways, but also so fascinating how it gets into the psychology of two different women who are married. One of them uh, is a scientist. She goes on a mission to the bottom of the ocean, which is only meant to be for a short amount of time, but ends up lasting multiple months. And when she returns from that journey, she is much changed. So we follow her her narrative as she is going to the bottom of the ocean and what happens there, but also the narrative of her wife as um, when um, she returns and is so different and how she is trying to manage this change that has occurred in her wife and what it says about their relationship. And um, and so this yeah, novel is so eerie and, and odd, uh, but also it does that thing where it feels like you can almost grasp the meaning. I felt like I almost get it, but it's always just out of reach. And I feel like that's so enticing and makes me want to read the book again. The Books Are My Bag Reader's Award was given to Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. This is a much loved novel. And again, it's so great to see it get some book prize attention because I feel like it's so skillfully done. The way she represents the lives of uh, two friends um, over a long period in their lives from their um, childhood um, to their adult life when they go into business together and um, create uh, games together and um, following that uh, it's kind of a nostalgic trip for me because I played a lot of these video games when I was younger so identified um, with that aspect of it but as many people say you don't need to enjoy video games to appreciate this novel because the way it explores the the love between friends over a period of time and the real struggles um, that friends sometimes go through, you know, especially when it comes to business relationships and um, and how they want to um, inhabit the world and, and represent their opinions. And, and it does get into larger like political issues, especially towards the end of the book. And I found that so fascinating and really gripped me all the way to the end. At the Irish Book Awards, the Eason Novel of the Year was given to The Beasting by Paul Murray which was also shortlisted for this year's Booker Prize. I feel like it probably got quite close to, to winning this year's award. And this is such a majestic 
family story following uh, a husband and wife and um, their uh, teenage and uh, adolescent uh, daughter and son uh, following their different perspectives and you see their points of view uh, and the way he inhabits their different voices um, is so convincing and that's really impactful but also how they misunderstand their different family members and so this says so much about family life the the way that um, we can physically and sometimes emotionally be so close to our members of family, but really fundamentally misunderstand things about them and how we aren't entirely honest with people in our family and um, how that can cause real difficulties. So each member of this family is going through their own personal struggles, but also as a family, they are about to implode. And this novel also touches upon environmental concerns and social concerns in a really fascinating Fascinating way, and it is so gripping. I don't think any other book I've read this year um, is <laughs> it has so many cliffhangers and kept me on the edge of my seat, wanting to know what was going to happen. So even though it's quite a long book, it is such a page turner that gripped me all the way through. The LA Times Book Prize for Fiction went to Solenoid by Mercia Cartaresco, translated by Sean Cotter. And this is honestly one of the most brilliant books I have ever read. It is mesmerizing. It is fascinating, has so many layers to it, is quite a challenging book to read. Uh, the, the narrative is very dense and each sentence is packed with so many layers and meaning. So uh, it took me a long time to read and not just because it is such a long book, but it is so worthwhile. I was just talking about this with another reader in the, the comments recently that uh, yeah, it's it's an incredible experience. Um, it follows a man who is very introverted, looking at his life, keeping a notebook and trying to record his experience and memories and dreams um, in a very honest way. So it is this like searing examination of the self and what makes up a life. But also there are all these surreal occurrences in the community around him and what this says about the political circumstances that he grew up in and also like his own emotional insecurities and issues is so interesting and uh, so there's so many tantalizing details about this but also the writing is really graceful um it it does have this uh, great humor to it as as well just like tinged with it a lot of it is like quite solemn but there is a tinge of humor there that um also helped carry me through and just left me enraptured the winner of this year's goldsmith prize which is an award um for fiction which breaks the mold of the novel and the the winner definitely does that cuddy by benjamin myers and this is such an inventive book but also a really emotional and involving story so i just read this very recently and it is so worthwhile and and Gripping, I'm following uh, Saint Cuthbert, um, who is the unofficial patron saint of the north of England and a cathedral which was built um, in his honor. So it's following from his life, from his devotees very early on um, and then through the centuries of the impact um, both he made and this cathedral made and his following um, over that period of time. And the way Benjamin Myers um, shows and represents history in this way um, is so fascinating, but also getting into the individual lives of um, some more marginalized figures um, who aren't op often represented in fiction um, is, is so excellent. And, uh, and each of their lives is really fascinating on its own. And the way he shows the progression through time of ideas and um, social change and and what we value as a community and as individuals and and how that alters over time it's it's so interesting and the final story of this book has a character that i felt so emotionally close to um it was very impactful and very moving and yeah just i am so glad to see benjamin myers 
get some recognition. At the British Book Awards this year, which is also called the Nibbies, the winner of the Fiction Prize was Babel by R.F. Kwan, which I, I did read um, towards the end of last year, and I did mostly enjoy the experience of this novel and the adventure of it and the way it incorporates a lot of ideas about colonization and the language and how that transforms and change and is perverted over time. Yeah, it's it's really interesting in that way, but I felt like the story got a bit too um, generic for me, like later on in this sort of struggle, big battle between a large institution and a group of rebels. Um, yeah, I, I kind of lost interest in it and wasn't, didn't feel quite as involved with some of the characters as I ideally wanted to. The Nibby's debut book of the year was Trespasses by Louise Kennedy, which was also shortlisted for this year's Women's Prize for Fiction and is an incredible novel about Northern Ireland and a woman who is a teacher, um, but she falls in love with uh, a man who's uh, on the other side of the sectarian conflict. And so it's about the issues involved in that. And I, I just remember how these larger political issues like impact the lives of the children that she's teaching and the way she represents the, that in this novel is so powerful. And her writing is superb. The Discover book of the year was I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel, uh, which was also long listed for this year's Women's Prize for Fiction, and which I, I did appreciate reading. Um, it gives really different point of view, a uh, very striking uh, character um, who is infatuated not just with a certain man, but uh, with this man's lover. And this man also has a wife. So it's a very messy romantic situation. Um, but she also discusses the way um, that race plays a factor um, in this dynamic of these relationships and economic um, disparity um, between these different characters. So it is very compelling in that way. Um, it is a very like moody book um, that uh, that feels like um, it's quite like pessimistic in its outlook, which is understandable because it's a kind of insoluble situation that we're all wrapped up in, you know, whether we want to or not. Um, not just this particular example, but the way it's speaking about a lot of these larger societal issues. I, mean, I think we are all sort of trapped in it. Um, but yeah, I, I just wish that there was a bit more like hope or maybe solutions like offered in this book, um, but at the same time, it is a very impactful novel. And the nonfiction narrative book of the year was one by Super Infinite by Catherine Rundell. This is a biography of the life of John Donne, but such a compelling story. Even if you aren't interested in this poet and this historical figure, um, the way she writes about his life is so compelling and such beautiful writing like on its own. And I've always had this slight like fascination with John Donne and his poetry. She shows how he was also a religious outsider and a kind of celebrity preacher of his time. And he had such a fascinating and complex life, but also the way he composed and distributed his poems were very different. I mean, a lot of his poems, there isn't any final form that exists because a lot of his poems like weren't printed, they were just kind of passed around between people and subtly altered over time. And the way he distilled his vision and understanding of life into these poems um, still resonates, you know, despite this fact of there being no final version. And Catherine Rundell is a bit of a literary superstar um, because she wrote this great biography, but she also wrote a children's book this year, um, which actually became the Waterstones book of the year. That was just declared very recently. Sticking with some nonfiction book prizes, the Royal Society Science Book Prize was won this year by An Immense World by Ed Yun. And this looks at how different animals and creatures in our world have a very different way of sensing and perceiving the world around them from how we do. And uh, so in exploring a number of different fascinating examples of this gives us a different perspective on 
reality and the, the world around us. The British Academy Book Prize for Global Cultural Understanding was won this year by Courting India by Nandini Das. This is a historical book uh, looking at a British diplomat uh, named Thomas Rowe, who in 1615 traveled to India to become the first ambassador with the Mughal Empire of that time, and how this relationship and policy they formed really laid the groundwork for political and social relations between these two different parts of the world for a long period of time and set into motion uh, the colonialism um, which dominated and reshaped the country so radically. It's absolutely fascinating and says so much about the, the past but also about the present. The Jalak Prize celebrates books by British or British resident BAME writers and the winner this year is None of the Above by Travis Alabanza. And in this book, the author examines a number of different words that have been directed at them to characterize them. Um, some of these words are celebratory, some of them are meant um, as offensive terms. So it's really looking at this language and these different terms which are used to define other people, um, which are used to define um, people themselves, and what this, this language means really unpacking these different terms and how uh, it relates to the life of this author in particular as uh, a black, mixed-raced, and non-binary individual. The Rathbones Folio Prize Book of the Year was given to Constructing a Nervous System by Margot Jefferson, which is in part a cultural study but also in part a memoir. Um, she utilizes a number of cultural references and how they relate to her own life, but also what they say um, about a black female body, about um, gender and race in America today. Um, it's such an inventive form of writing. The David Cohen Prize for Literature, um, like the Nobel Prize, is awarded to an author for their body of work, and it's awarded every other year. And the winner this year was Scottish author John Burnside, who writes in a number of different forms in fiction and nonfiction, uh, essay and memoir and poetry. He has written a lot of poetry and he often um, writes uh, about myth and history but also the, the natural world um, but uh, also mental health and um, the, the impact of family life and um, so yeah about a wide variety of subjects um, through different forms. Another book award which is given to an author for their body of work is the Joyce Carol Oates Prize. Of course I have to mention Joyce Carol Oates and there's a prize named after her. And this is uh, given to authors um, who are seen as kind of mid-career authors that have produced a number of works, but uh, probably still will be producing some quite major books, hopefully. And the winner this year was Manuel Munoz. And uh, I have read uh, his collection of stories on um, the consequences, which is so fascinating. I'm um, looking at um, the Latin American uh, experience and uh, representing the lives of a number of different individuals um, in different um, social situations, um, also some gay characters. And uh, yeah, I really enjoy his work and want to explore more of it. The Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award was given to Tom Ben for his novel Oxblood, which takes place in Manchester in the mid-1980s, um, following three different generations of women and how their lives have been impacted by the criminal men who have been part of their family. Um, so it's quite uh, a tense tale, but also looking at larger issues of economic disparity and marginalized individuals in Britain. The Wilbur Smith Adventure Writing Prize was won by Australian book No Country for Girls by Emma Stiles. This is a novel about two young women who are from different side of 
the tracks, um, as it were. But they both get unintentionally involved in a murder and they go on the run together. So it's following um, their fast-paced and harrowing journey, but uh, also their connection with each other, but also what this says um, about gender roles and the, the place of women in Australian society. Staying down under, there is also the Stella Prize, which celebrates Australian women's writing. And the winner this year is a collection of poetry, The Jaguar by Sarah Holland Batt. And in this collection, um, she explores the impact of her father being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, uh, but also grappling with feelings of grief. Moving over to Canada, and yes, I am talking about the Giller Prize, and the winner this year was Study for Obedience by Sarah Bernstein, which was also shortlisted for this year's Booker Prize, and is the novel which I probably went on the biggest journey this year, like as a reading experience, because even though it's quite a short novel, I did start reading it at the end of the summer, but quickly abandoned it because I was not enjoying it at all or felt like I was getting much out of it. But then I returned to it on the encouragement of a lot of readers and because I was intrigued to try to take up the challenge of reading the entire book and I appreciated it so much more. Uh, it is a really impactful experience and gives a very different point of view um, about how we inhabit the society around us and our role in it when sometimes our role is defined by other people and we might be persecuted by other people for unfair reasons and how do we react to that? How do we process that? And how do we deal with living in the world in that way? The way that this novel explores that I think is so unique and has left a lasting impression on me. And to end, there is the Forward Prizes for Poetry, and the winner of Best Collection this year was Self-Portrait as Othello by Jason Allen Passant. This imagines, through interlocking poems, the Shakespearean figure of Othello, but in a modern context text and in the urban landscapes of London and Paris and Venice and how he would process his intersecting identities in uh, the current world. So those are all the book prizes and winners I want to talk about. Um, if I've left out any prizes, um, let me know uh, in the comments below. I'd like to hear about some more and discuss them. And I'd love to hear what you think about any of these books. And are these the best books of the year? I think quite a few of them are, and it's why I enjoy following book prizes so much, because it really directs me to some quality books when there are so, so many books to choose from. But of course, it's not completely comprehensive. These aren't necessarily all the best books of the year, and all of the discussion that goes along with a lot of these book prizes is really part of the joy of it, of everyone can root for their favorite books and discuss them and discuss discuss certain titles in more depth than we normally would if we were just reading them on our own. And so, yeah, that's why I enjoy following book prizes, why I'm an addict and why I should probably go to some meetings to discuss it. But uh, I'd love to hear what you think um, about all of this in the comments below. And I hope you're doing well and reading good things. And I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.